Good morning. Welcome to On the Frontline. We are coming to you live this morning from the McNair campus of the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I'm Dr. Jim McDevitt. I'm Executive Vice President and Dean of Clinical Affairs at the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Paul Klotman, who would ordinarily be here, was called away to deal with some uh, pressing family issues. Uh, sorry he can't be here. I would say his loss is my gain because uh, I love my job. I love being at Baylor. But literally, my favorite thing to do is this, uh, talking to clinical and research rock stars at Baylor, of which there are many, uh, and sharing that with all of you. Uh, and that's what we're going to do this morning. And uh, before I introduce our talent for today, uh, our impressive panel, uh, Dr. Klopman asked me to share some general updates around the college before we get to all things, uh, all things cancer. Uh, a couple of leadership updates, uh, significant new leader positions. Uh, Dr. Catherine Gordon was retreated, was recruited uh, by Baylor to be the new chair of pediatrics and the new physician in chief at Texas Children's Hospital. She starts in September. She comes from uh, from Boston, has a particular interest in. Uh, she's an endocr a pediatric endocrinologist, has an interest in bone metabolism. A really a wonderful, uh, wonderful leader, and is going to add a lot to our team. Uh, Dr. Dan Hamstra uh, also recently came from Michigan as our new chair of radiation oncology. Uh, updates from the educational programs, uh, the School of Medicine, as many of you probably know, we have about 188 uh, medical students. They all went through the match process recently to find their residency positions. Uh, I'm going to give you a lot of zero percentage numbers, and these zero percentages are all good. Uh, zero percent of our resident, of our graduating students failed to secure a, a, a residency position. They all matched in, in programs, usually their first or second choice. Of interest, 44%, uh, nearly half, went into primary care fields. So Baylor, Baylor continues to be a leader in producing primary care physicians for the nation. And 55 of those 188 stayed in the state of Texas. And this is a great story because Baylor is really a talent magnet because we compete with the best medical schools around the country. We're recruiting uh, young people to be students here that would be going to Harvard or Yale or Stanford or UPenn uh, around the country, they choose to come to Baylor and then they choose to stay and do the residency and then they choose to stay and work and uh, live and research in, in Texas. Uh, so that's a great, uh, great success. Uh, the uh, GME programs, the residency programs, uh, we also, we, we match students from other places coming to, to Baylor. Uh, we have 42 training programs, 316 new residents and fellows uh, coming in, matched 100% of those positions, uh, didn't, didn't match uh, 0%. Uh, other exciting news, actually re very exciting news, uh, we are getting serious about building a new School of Medicine building. Uh, and again, I'm standing on the McNair campus. Uh, behind me will be the Jamail building, if you're familiar with the campus. Uh, we're looking at putting a School of Medicine building uh, on this campus. We're in the planning stages. Uh, we, there'll be a process to, uh, to get this up, but, uh, but a, a steady schedule now of uh, concept design scoping, uh, uh, getting the financing in place to build the building. Uh, and I think we'll see dirt turning on this campus before too much more time goes by. Uh, and then more proximate, uh, we've entered into an arrangement you might have heard about uh, with Baylor Scott and White, where we are opening a, another campus of the Baylor College of Medicine in Temple, Texas. Uh, and to be clear, this is not a new medical school. It is Baylor College of Medicine, one school, two locations. We will have a, uh, a secondary or a second campus uh, in, uh, in Temple, Texas. We will enroll our first class of 40 students in 2023. Uh, four-year school, uh, so that'll grow to 160 students uh, for the four years following 2023, so very, very exciting. I'll finish uh, with a couple of comments specific about cancer and the Daniel Duncan Conference of Cancer Center, of which many on this uh, Zoom are, are, are intimately familiar with. Uh, Daniel Duncan, extremely successful, and again, NCI-designated Conference of Cancer Centers, there are only three in the state of Texas, we're one of the three. There are only 50 across the United States of America, uh, so it's a, it's a, they're, 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 it's a, uh, a small club. Uh, impressive history, uh, and Daniel Duncan has uh, is, is young by uh, by standards of uh, comprehensive cancer centers. In the time that Daniel Duncan has been in existence, uh, we have raised between philanthropy, uh, grants, uh, Texas funds, uh, federal funds, NIH. A total of $2.1 billion. 
$2.1 billion, which is really a stunning figure in a very short period of time. Uh, we enroll about 400 to 500 patients in clinical trials every year. Uh, we have goals to make that number much, much higher. That's one of our priorities is to imp improve our uh, recruiting into clinical trials. Uh, we opened in the building I'm standing on the seventh floor, a cancer center. So the entire seventh floor is now a cancer center uh, where we see our uh, physicians, our medical oncologists, our surgical oncologists, our infusion center are all located on that space. We sort of squeeze them into that space to, to, to co-locate our cancer center in one place. We are very close now to moving them a second time to the new medical office building, which is going off uh, the corner of this building, uh, which we ready for occupancy in January of 2023. Uh, so it seems like a long way off. It's really not uh, the um, and that'll give us an opportunity to really have a true cancer center with a physical presence, with its own entrance uh, and uh, a much greater presence on this on this campus. So very excited about uh, about that. Uh, a word about the uh, Lester and Sue Smith uh, uh, Breast Center. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the most successful uh, center in the in the cancer center. It, it probably is. If it's not the most successful, it's one of the most successful. Uh, grant funding in that center has grown uh, over the past uh, uh, six years from $2 million to $22 million. Uh, that's a uh, tenfold increase. Uh, Dr. Ellis, who I'm going to introduce in just a minute, in the time that he's uh, been here, has increased funding for breast cancer uh, 14-fold, uh, which is impressive. I was a department chair once, and there was one year that we doubled our department of uh, uh, research funding, and I thought we were really doing great. Uh, we were uh, in the junior leagues when you're increasing things by 10 and 14, uh, 10 and 14 times. And then we are one of uh, six SPOR grants. Uh, SPOR is Specialized Programs of Research Excellence, uh, funded by the NIH. Maybe we'll talk about SPOR in the uh, question answer uh, center. Um, so, so much for news for the college. I, I want to get right to our speakers and the, the, the flow of things today is they're going to give a little bit of uh, talk uh, to uh, the, uh, um, they're going to give a little bit of talk about their work uh, and then we'll have an opportunity for uh, question and answers. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ellis. Uh, Dr. Ellis is a McNair, is a McNair Scholar and Director of Lester and Sue Smith uh, Breast Cancer Center uh, and Dr. Bora Lim uh, who is the Director of Translational Research at the Daniel Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Ellis is incredibly accomplished. Uh, he's got an incredibly long CV, uh, Director of the Breast Center, McNair College, uh, CPRIT funded, uh, and the Ken Osborne Endowed uh, Chair. Uh, he leads a group, he leads a large group, uh, oncologists, uh, epidemiologists, pathologists, basic scientists, statisticians, uh, really looking at um, ways to control breast cancer, prevent, detect, uh, treat, uh, and uh, I think particular interest in more advanced uh, breast cancer, the, the, the harder cases. And Dr. Bora Lim, another rock star, uh, directs translational research uh, with a particular interest in new therapy strategies to, to eradicate, again, aggressive forms of breast cancer, not your run-of-the-mill breast cancer. Uh, and in particular, looking at biomarkers in the design of clinical trials. I think that's part of what they're going to talk about today. Uh, so I'm going to bring up uh, Dr. Ellis to make some comments. I would ask you in the chat if you can put your questions in the chat. We're going to do questions and answers in just a second. Uh, and I'll be uh, pulling questions off of that chat. So uh, please feel free to ask away. Dr. Ellis? Thank you. Uh Dr. McDevitt, that was very gracious of you. So I've treated uh, hundreds and hundreds of breast cancer patients. I've actually been treating breast cancer patients for over 30 years. And during the course of that 30-year period, of course, I've experienced many triumphs, but many tragedies. And when we experience tragedy in breast cancer, what I like to say is, we haven't really made the diagnosis. We, don't re we didn't really understand sufficiently deeply what exactly was wrong with that particular patient. What exactly uh, was the nature of their breast cancer? I mean, still to this day, we have forms of breast cancer that are called triple negative breast cancer. So if you think about that for just two moments, you'd realize 
that that cancer is named after what it is not, not what it is. So I was attracted to Baylor College of Medicine because it's one of the few places in the world where you can do something like this. Okay, so what this is supposed to depict is the idea that you could take a cancer, break it up into all its constituent parts. And the parts I'm referring to, of course, are the DNA. We all made of DNA, but cancer cells, the DNA is messed up in all sorts of ways. And in fact, in very complicated ways and in ways that are unique to each cancer. That's why breast cancer is so what we saw heterogeneous. But it turns out that just knowing the nature of the DNA changes is not enough to drive us through to that critical question of how to treat in each individual cancer. So then there was a period of time where we we're measuring a lot of the next stage in the information exchange in biology called RNA. Now, RNA is, we're all talking about it today because we have RNA-based vaccines, right? The point about the RNA vaccine is instructs the, 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 the synthesis of something called a protein. In the case of the vaccine, it's obviously a part of the COVID virus, in which you can then have an immune response to. But imagine that in a cancer cell, you're talking at literally thousands of genes being abnormally expressed, making thousands of abnormal proteins. How on earth do you sort of triangulate all that information and turn it into something that you could use to talk to a patient about their illness. So around 10 years ago, when I was still at Washington University in St. Louis, I came across these instruments called mass spectrometers. So I like to think of the mass spectrometer as a bit like the Hubble telescope. So the bottom line is we built the Hubble telescope to look deep into the universe and get these fabulous looking pictures like that ring galaxy there, taking a photograph deep into the universe to understand how the universe is formed and how it's function. So the mass spectrometer is the same way. It just looks in the other direction. It looks at very, very small things, not very, very large things, and creates essentially pictures of cancers that are a little bit like that ring galaxy, a degree of resolution we've never seen before. And this was a breakthrough uh, about six years ago. And you can see there on the left, a paper in uh, Nature where we described uh, what we'd achieved. Now, it's great to have papers in Nature, but you've got to convert that fantastic technology into something that's useful for a patient. The other thing in passing, I would say, is we're not stopped at breast cancer. Here are six papers that we've been involved in, literally, in just the last year where we're describing not only new biological features of breast cancer, but new biological features of ovarian cancer, of kidney cancer, of endometrial cancer, of lung cancer. These are all, and colon cancer. These are all the big killers of, uh, of patients. They're all difficult to treat in often uh, circumstances. And we're beginning to find new ways to treat uh, patients as a result of this explosion of new information about how cancers actually uh, form and what their therapeutic vulnerabilities are. Now, I'm only showing this slide to give you a sense that we are making uh, uh, a progress. Um, the uh, uh, philanthropy, for example, is how to allow us to build this clinical delivery prototype. Now, what you'll see there on the bottom right is an orange box. That's actually a robot. And that robot allows us to analyze 20 tumors a day at the level of resolution I was referring to with that Hubble telescope. We can really deconvolute tumors really rapidly now. So that would mean theoretically you'd have a biopsy. You could come into this lab. We could convert that biopsy into biological information, which would then tell us something new about how to treat the patient. Now, this is not for the faint-hearted, right? Because when you receive all this information, you've got to parse it into sort of bits of uh, data upon which decisions can be made. So on the top right, you need lots of computation and statistics. And in fact, it turns out that the cloud, web computing, is the answer because it's infinitely scalable, right? You can use all that computer power 
not to watch movies, you can use that computer cloud to deconvolute cancers. Obviously, you need a lot of people who are very clever and understand pharmacology and biology. You need a lot of people who know how to make those instruments work on a, uh, on a, on a, on a, on a very reliable level, because obviously you can't have a machine breaking in the middle of trying to work out what's wrong with someone. And then the, but, but one of the more, most critical aspects of this is the clinical research and the biospecimens. So at Baylor College of Medicine, we built a team to achieve this. And the bottom left, we have Bora Lim, who's responsible for the translational research. What, what's meant by translational research? Well, the example here is when patients come to Baylor College of Medicine and they have a breast mass that needs a diagnosis, of course, we biopsy that mass to find out whether she has cancer and at the level of the standard of care, what type of breast cancer it is. But at that same moment, when the breast is anesthetized and the patient is comfortable, we take extra samples. And those extra samples are now going into that prototype to allow us to demonstrate that this new way of making a diagnosis is better than the old way. So I'm now going to have uh, Dr. Lim talk about this. Thank you, Dr. Metavid and Dr. Ellis for a wonderful introduction and talk. And I'm really honored to join this talk. And, you know, I'm, I wish that we could actually sit in the room and like see each other. But um, I guess uh, hopefully my makeup and everything kind of works for the, the event. <laughs> so I just would like to start by um, understanding of the cancer. So Dr. Ellis just uh, gave us a wonderful overview of what we are trying to achieve in the Lesser and Sue Smith Breast Center and then in Duncan Cancer Center. Uh, we are trying to achieve as both clinicians, translational researchers, along with the uh, basic translational researchers. So when I meet with my patients in the clinic, the very first thing, especially even though breast cancer is one in eight women, the most commonly affecting you know, women and 3% in men, um, I personally treat like men patients as well. A lot of us heard about breast cancer. Every October, everybody comes out with the pink tutus and the pom-poms and talk about breast cancer. But when it comes to your cancer, the very first thing that your patients will ask is, I mean, what does that even mean to have a breast cancer? And, you know, like this is kind of diagram sometimes I show my patients. As you can see here, we kind of measure the size of the tumor, you know, using the, the techniques, using the ultrasound, mammogram. And then there's a lymph node that is involved in the case. And I tell them, yeah, there's about pea size of your cancer. And then because the cancer loves to go to the lymph node, we're going to measure with the ultrasound and see where your cancer is at. And unfortunately, still as of 2021, where we are actually sending the spaceship to the Mars and we are talking about maybe moving and living in the Mars, we are still not fully understanding how some of these patients that we shake hands today will end up in a few years or even less than a year to end up having multiple cancers throughout their body that is showing on the right. As you can see here, um, but can you imagine, this was one of my very young patients who was 27 years old. She had a, a small lump in her axilla um, on the left side. And then there was the same side that her baby used to be, you know, hanging around her arm. She just assumed that it was because of her baby that she's having some maybe infection or something else going on. Um, ended up seeing multiple doctors who told her, oh, it's nothing infection will give you antibiotics to the point that she couldn't walk, she couldn't do anything, she had a severe back pain, went to the local ER and ended up having all of these dark spots, being cancer sitting in her bone. Um, you know, she was 27 years old and I lost her when she was 31 um, after she going through multiple treatments. So as you can see on the right, there's a still a lot of spread in the cancer that's happening throughout the organs, brain, bone, lung, liver, and others. Of course, we learn a lot of epidemiology. So in some way, while we are investigating any of these at the telescope in the lab, we also try to investigate how this actually clinical uh, investigations could be helpful in uncovering that biology. So who's actually, once we have that little clue that is still evolving in the case, who are actually involved in the breast cancer treatment? So I just put the faces that usually the patients meet in the clinic. So we will meet medical oncologists like myself and um, Dr. Ellis. There's a surgeon who's like an angel who come and take all your cancer and say, I, I cured you. 
And then there's a radiation oncologist who come and give a little bit of burn. So like in between the toxin giver like us and then the angel surgical oncology. But these are the only faces of the uh, people that who are behind the cancer. If you expand that circle just a little bit, in addition to the stream of dialysis or uh, physicians, there are a ton of patients that, um, you know, who's trying to raise the funds, help us in the research. There's an education we are trying to do for ourselves, our community oncologists, researchers, our growing mentees, students. So there's a large array of people who are actually involved in the care of itself. And I kind of like didn't put it in here, but pathologists, diagnostic imagers, so many others are who are working with us tirelessly trying to develop. And then, you know, my Involvement basically it's very very tiny here the clinical trial development but I personally think that that is a such an important factor because I'm showing here a picture of a young woman who's trying to pick a shoes so you know it really depends on is she going for her dinner with her friends is she going out with uh, somebody that who she needs to be very like professional and work related so even if we have a one you know, event where we are trying to pick a shoes, there's a variety of options based on your comfort, based on your shoe size, based on your daily selections and the, you know, the characteristic of the event. And yet in the cancer treatment, believe it or not, we still treat the cancer in the same way that we've been treating for 20 years ago, 10 years ago. There are some incremental changes, but this is really the time that for us to truly make a difference. And then that's why everybody's brain and minds get together to make this happen is so important. Um, at Baylor College of Medicine, you know, including such a giants in the breast cancer like Dr. Ellis, Dr. Rosen, Dr. Schiff, and many others, I am able to actually help them make the shoes. So in my pre previous institution, I felt like I was kind of maybe uh, like the salesman in the shoe shop. I have wonderful variety of 300 you know, pairs of shoes and say, oh yeah, by the way, we have these shoes with this color, blah, blah, blah. But in some cases, I didn't really understand or I didn't have a say in how the shoe was designed. At Baylor College of Medicine, we are able to create a new shoes for our patients, of course treatment, which is so much more important than the shoes, but just as a you know uh, metaphor. And not only focusing on the cancer cells in the DNA and RNA level, we have a capability to look into the proteins like Dr. Liz uh, alluded to. And there are other groups who are also looking into the cell that is affecting the cancer cells itself by introducing a very novel techniques that we can truly even have a micro map of how these cancers occur, can spread, and then affect our patients on a day-to-day basis. And when these things are happening, um, you know, I get to have all the fun, you know, so like my job is to make sure all of this bedside to bench, to bench to bedside, go back and forward and making sure that we have these beautiful shoes that we can present the patient who are in need today. But as you can see here, that's not an easy job. It actually takes a village to make this happen. There's a multidisciplinary care of educations and the patients, physicians, and all of these people who are the faces of the clinical care. But behind that, there's a people that who need to help to make sure that there is a novel clinical trial design can be delivered by a statistics team. There has to be a clinical trial unit where it's making sure that we are doing a proper job of the delivering the clinical trials. There is a multiple partners and company, NCI, regulatories, and multiple working groups. There's a basic translation research, which is a fundamental actual discovery part of the work. And then we have to collect a specimen to making sure that we actually can look into the actual patient's group. And most importantly, the grant funding and the sponsors so we can actually really move forward with a better tomorrow. And so why are we doing this? Why um, many of us in the breast center and then in the Duncan Cancer Center sleep, you know, three hours, four hours sometimes and, you know, go back to the lab and clinic and really trying to put our brains together? Because the women in front of you are not just one woman or men who if we save that one woman, maybe we can really save that woman to have multiple babies and children. We can really grow, you know, their children's going to the school and then become a country, you know, contributors of the community. And that is so important. That's why we are working so tirelessly. But as a physician, I think it's enough to say for me, I think it's the most important thing is like, how is the patient actually perceived? 
of what we are trying to do. So I think we're going to share a story of Bonnie, who is my dear patient, who followed me uh, from my previous institution to today, who is not only dealing with the difficult to treat uh, breast cancer, but also does have a condition in her liver, which makes the treatment very, very challenging. And Bonnie tells me every day why we really need to make a difference. So I would like to share her story. Being a patient and knowing, you know, about breast cancer, there is no one size fits all. It, there is so many different variants and so much morphing and changing and it is a guessing game. You know, if this doesn't work, we'll try this. If that doesn't work, we'll try that. But as you get, you know, one and one, the cancer drugs stop working as well. So Dr. Lim is the most compassionate, loving, caring individual I think I've ever met. I actually look forward to seeing her because she's comforting. And even though she doesn't have all the answers because no one does, she gives you her best. She does listen to me and she knows how much I research. She tells me her advice and she monitors me very closely, which I love. I need to be monitored closely because we don't know. You know, I haven't had been lucky with chemo. I have been on, I think it's 15, I have a list. I don't know, she has a list. Of every chemo I was on, when I started, how long I was on, and when it stopped working. And there's been a lot. If we had precision medicine now, there would be less guessing, more definite, you know, definite um, medicines that will work and not a hit and miss guessing game. And then having progression and then having to do, you know, harder work to do to the next thing. Every time I'm on a different chemo, it works less and less because I've been on so many. But if we have precision medicine, I think that would be the end of this battle, it, as I call it. Even though I may never see it, my hope is that I will. But if I don't, then I'm on the foreground here and can share my story with others. I am a fight in progress every day, 100%. Well, thanks for Bonnie. Thanks to Bonnie for sharing her her, her story. The, the, the science is fascinating and, and intellectually interesting, but uh, as Bonnie said, I think uh, fundamentally it's all about doctors taking care of patients and having a great patient experience. I think it's really one of the unique things about Baylor is we're training the next generation of healthcare providers. We have the best science in the country, uh, and we can bring that to our patients in a way that is humane and empathetic and, uh, and, and be good doctors. So, so thanks to Dr. Lim. Thanks to Dr. Ellis for all you, uh, for all you do. We're going to have a little bit of question and answer. I'll echo Dr. Lim. I wish this was in per person because it's a little bit stilted and artificial. We're sitting in a conference room staring at each other across a, a gulf. Uh, we'll back and forth with the camera a little bit. I would encourage you to put your questions in the chat uh, and we'll try to get as many questions answered as possible. And also put in the plug for next time we do this, please try and I think the next time it'll be in person because we'll be COVID will be in a place that we can do this face to face. And it's a much richer experience when we're all sitting in a room together. So I hope you, you, you plan on coming to the, to the next one. I'm going to start with a term that we hear a lot and it was mentioned by Dr. Ellis, this term triple negative breast cancer. Just to start with, can you just flesh that out a little bit? What, 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 when you say triple negative breast cancer, what, what, what is that exactly? Yeah, I mean, so I always tell uh, my patient, you know, kind of like rough term. The microphone on? Yeah, um, that it's actually like what is, is like, so when we are talking about the hormone receptor positive cancers or HER2 positive cancer, we determine or define that molecular subtype based on what is expressed in that cancer. But triple negative breast cancer, basically I tell them there's a three important food that cancer can feed on estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 receptor. If you don't have one, two, three, you are triple negative. So basically it's a group of cancer that doesn't fit in in the other group. And then we think that there might be four to six different actual subtypes or maybe more. They're a very heterogeneous group. And because of lack of the clear def definition of the food that how the cancer can survive, we don't really have a good targeted therapy to really truly save them. And there's a unique biology that we are actually investigating, you know, along with Dr. Ellis, truly trying to define maybe it's not just triple negative, but what really is. So that's. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. But actual fact, um, 
that's probably an area we've made the most progress in the with the our with months. our proteogenomics approach, because uh, what's really obvious when you look at these tumors is that they have damaged DNA repair mechanisms. There's actually a small group of triple negative breast cancers we should really call BRCA1 deficient because they mm. occur in women who have hereditary breast cancer and they, ex they respond exquisitely well to a pill that makes their cancers go away and with very little toxicity. So that's a really good example of how when you understand the nature of the disease, the therapy comes apparent and that therapy is so much better than regular chemotherapy. Now, unfortunately, that's only a small subset of the triple negatives, but we're getting to see some of the other patterns that might be druggable in these DNA repair pathways uh, and sort of sort of watch this space because uh, we're yeah. quite excited in the lab about some of these possibilities. Yeah. So thematically, you probably picked up on this, but we, we, we see routine breast cancer. We see the breast cancer that's not particularly difficult to, to, to treat or where the, tr the treatment is well established. But I think one of the unique things about Baylor is we also see kind of the most challenging and the worst of the worst cases. We see the people that show up with widely metastatic uh, disease. Uh, I want to talk about that just a, a little bit, and may maybe I'll ask Dr. Ellis to address this first, because you may have noticed if you were watching the video, Dr. Ellis is slightly more senior than Dr. Uh, Dr. Lim, ever so slightly <laughs> more. Uh, but I want to think about, and, and keep in mind, we have an audience out there that is, in most cases, not really medical, uh, really a lay audience. Uh, but I want to think about at the beginning of your career, Dr. Ellis, talking to a patient that comes into your clinic with advanced breast cancer, uh, at the beginning of your career, what was that conversation like? What What did you say to a woman with advanced ca uh, breast cancer at the beginning of your, uh, your career? And how's that conversation changed today? Well, um, one thing that we still have to say that's the same 20 years ago, as it is today, is generally speaking, triple um, metastatic breast cancer is not curable. And that's, I would say, uh, very disappointing to me if I've worked on this problem that long and haven't been able to cure metastatic breast cancer. Uh, metastatic breast cancer, I view that as a failure. Um, and um, so clearly the problem's not an easy one. What's different today though, is that we do have an, in, in, a, an ever expanding list of treatments that are more precise and less toxic than just giving patients chemotherapy. So we have drugs that we can add to endocrine agents to make those endocrine agents work longer. Uh, we have now some mutation matched therapies uh, and I won't go into the details there, but really precise drugs that inhibit the action of a protein that's become abnormal in the cancer cell. And then most excitingly, we're beginning to understand that the cancer is in balance with the immune system. And so that if you can unleash the immune system, like the immune system unleashes itself on coronavirus, we can actually get quite remarkable regressions in some patients. Now, have we cured some patients with immunological approaches? There's been to be a sneaking suspicion we have, in fact, achieved that in a few cases. And so there's sort of now a triangulation between immune boosting therapies plus agents that control the tumor long enough for the immune system to kick in and recognize the tumor is very, very part, much part and parcel of what we're doing, even to the point where we're actually using engineered immune cells. And we have this wonderful center at Baylor, the Center for Cell and Gene Therapy, where we're actually using artificial immune cells, literally, that are programmed against the cancer and you infuse these artificial immune cells into the patient to attack the tumor. So I actually can now see, with a 30-year perspective, that it, I think we might be curing metastatic breast cancer within the next 10 years. Not probably everybody, but interestingly, maybe in some of those younger patients, that the tragedy that you referred to was breaks my heart when I see that. I almost have post-traumatic stress disorder myself because I've seen so many ladies like that, but they have younger immune systems and probably uh, are the ones where the immune rejection approaches could be very effective. So safe to say, like a lot of things, like HIV, like melanoma, and there, there are many diseases that were very poor treatments, very poor outcomes, and became more chronic diseases that are manageable. It sounds like you're approaching a point where maybe it's not a death sentence, but it's a you have treatments that you are beginning 
to at least theoretically extend life, extend quality of life, and potentially even cure at some uh, at some point in the in the future. Has that gotten for metastatic breast cancer to the point yet that that's a measurable impact in outcomes? Have we seen improvements nationally in metastatic breast cancer, or are we we're not quite to that point yet? Well, there the, there are improvements in overall survival, but it's been very uh, uh, you know tricky to show with many of these therapies. But we are beginning to see those improvements in overall survival in our in a, in our trials, and so that's very heartening to see. Um, Although nationally, we still have a very, very high uh, incidence of death from uh, breast cancer over 42,000, 42, you know, the exact statistic, sadly, um, over 42,000 uh, deaths a year in the United States. And of course, you know, globally, probably over half a million uh, deaths from breast cancer. So, so we still got a long way to go. But I think it does come back to the issue I was trying to push in my talk, which is we do best in oncology when we make a profound, deep diagnosis what the nature of that, that mm -hmm. particular cancer is. Just in the way you're describing, to, cure H, to, to treat HIV, you had to know there was a virus called HIV, right? Uh, I, was, I was part of the um, you know, physicians who gave some of the first drugs for chronic myeloid leukemia. When I was a med student, they get allogeneic bone marrow transplant, which is a pretty miserable treatment. And then suddenly someone invented a pill and the, all those malignant white cells just disappeared for years on end. And we actually do see that now in patients getting certain drug combinations for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer or HER2 positive breast cancer. There's an area where there are evidence we've cured metastatic breast cancer. I personally have cured patients with HER2 positive breast cancer yeah. that spread to the chest, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think it's there. Uh, we just need to keep pushing. Yeah, I mean, so some of the estrogen receptor positive patients or the HER2 positive patients, they go way beyond 20 years and, you know, they might be still be on the maintenance therapy. So I think one difference that maybe we can make in there would be, you know, so like one of the things that I tell my patients, like between stage three and stage four, there's really fine um, balance that if you're stage three, you'll get a graduation card. If you're stage four, you're stuck with me for the rest of your life. So that's how it is, you know. So I think when I first started my breast cancer training, uh, my program director, who was a really good friend of Dr. Osborne, who could probably share her, his story that, so Bora, when do you think that we're going to start testing everybody's tumor with the genomics? So I, I told him, ah, maybe like 20 years, you know. So that was only like a um, little over 10 years ago. And now literally we test everybody, even in the early setting and also more important in the metastatic breast cancer patients. And our hope is eventually we will not only test there in the genomics, but we are able to even test the purely genomics and truly really understand what your true cancer has to tell us the secret so we can actually make you to the point that you really don't see any cancer every time we scan you. So. Yeah, so part of what I think I hear you saying from your talks and from the answers you just, uh, just, just gave us uh, is you are not going to show up next Tuesday and announce that we have a cure for advanced breast cancer. It's not a pill, a treatment, uh, a drug, uh, that you're probably looking at a myriad of, frankly, probably different diseases uh, with different treatments. And to, and to, to a lot of the focus of your work, the, the ability to personalize that treatment for a given tumor. Uh, you, I hear you saying that's probably the breakthrough that is, that is coming, that ability to provide that very directed care at a particular tumor. So what I, and I know you referenced that you only sleep two hours of uh, a night. You, you look very refreshed. So I find that hard to believe. But um, yeah, you're working hard. Uh, you're incredibly dedicated. Uh, it's, it's some personal sacrifice. You'd like to get there as quick as you can. Why can't we get there faster? What What are the barriers? What if if, uh, if if you were king of the world and could put any place the thing in place you needed? How could we accelerate this process? <sighs> We want to start. <laughs> well, um, I think uh, accelerate our ability to deliver those more sophisticated diagnoses so you can match the right treatment to the right patient. So uh, let's, we talked a little bit about triple negative breast cancer. Let's just, just take this as an example. The drugs used in triple negative breast cancer are nonspecific chemotherapy drugs developed in the 60s and 70s. So the drugs themselves are some of them 40 or 50 years old from their moment of discovery and the way you're still using them today. 
the triple negative breast cancer gets a sort of alphabet soup of these drugs. And then after six months, half of them approximately are told it didn't work. Half. So imagine instead of doing that, you developed a test to tell you before you got your prescription pad out, this is a patient in whom those, that alphabet soup is very unlikely to work. Well, then you'd give them a clinical trial tailored to that type of cancer immediately, mm -hmm. not when they've been suffered through all that chemotherapy, had lots of side effects, messed up their immune system, and then be told it hadn't worked. Now, if you think about it, there's not a lot of money in telling, you know, in terms of, you know, pharmaceutical company type thinking about predicting, you know, uh, how the standard of care works or not. These are, not, these are generic drugs, right? It's only in academics that we're passionate about these, these kinds of things. But they're absolutely critical to open the door to the right uh, treatments in the future. That's just an example of I'm thinking today, mm -hmm. but I mean, yeah, you, then, you, you have some wonderful comments as well, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing and more fundamental thing. And I think in the end, you know, just like anything else we do as a human being, this is like a teamwork. And um, I think there are some fundamental things that we could potentially change that a lot of junior to midterm investigators spend so much time trying to write a grant and trying to get the money to actually do the research that you think that is going to work. So instead of having all of those times and brain and all the team dedicated to actually doing the work, sometimes we have to kind of swarm ourselves into the paperwork and preparation. Of course, there's a value of all of doing this. And so if I was king of the world and say, you, 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 smart people, come with me, do this work, do this work, let me give you money. And then I'll make sure that we'll have a you know, team together to make sure all of these uh, red tapes are going through. So your trials can actually open today instead of having to spend like two years going through multiple steps and finally able to open. Um, so I think there's a lot of lagging as we are like pushing the whole like field forward. So, um, you know, recognizing that importance of the breaking that like administrative and then red tape barriers, I think is another important thing that we can get some help from. Yeah, what I also heard you say is this is not Dr. Lim thinking deep thoughts in the still of the night about how to cure breast cancer. It is a large team of people with a lot of very specialized expertise, uh, with, with a, a specialized knowledge uh, that is data intensive, that is computing intensive. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a resource intensive coordination to, to get to these answers. They're not simple, simple answers. I have a, a question out of the chat. I think it might be a brief answer because I think it might have been answered partially. But the question is, how do you see the potential of immunotherapies in breast cancer? I mean, I, I personally am very, very hopeful. And then one of the thing I would say is the immunotherapy um, is encompassing large like chunk of different um, strategies. So the one of the immunotherapy that is currently approved for our patients is using something we call checkpoint inhibitor. So if there is a cell that is trying to eat up the cancer and then there's a cancer cell, they're trying to fight the battle. And then basically they put out the cancer cells, put out the break. And then the current therapy that is approving breast cancer simply just unbreak the break. And so the cancer cells can be tacked on and they'd be eaten by the immune system. But in addition to that, there's a lot of things we can do like vaccines is one of them. It's also immunotherapy. There's a, the engineer T cell, which is the immunotherapy. NK cells immunotherapy. So many of this other immunotherapy is somewhat underutilized. And I think that's one of the things that we are really trying to work hard with the other teams within the Baylor. And, and I sometimes tell my patients, like, I think that there is a precision oncology we can try today. If you do well for the next two to three years, maybe we can come and just bombard your cancer with the immune system. So that's, I think it's very hopeful. So you it's can, oh, go ahead, Matthew. Well, it's hopeful, but there are problems. I mean, of course, yeah. I mean, so for example, breast cancer is one of the less immunogenic tumors. Mm -hmm. So for example, you were mentioning melanoma earlier. Well, actually in melanoma, immunotherapy can be remarkably effective. We don't see that so often in breast cancer. And of course, um, therefore you need to have predictive tests. This is the kind of breast cancer in which, for example, those immune checkpoint blockade drugs should work. But we've just seen a clinical trial actually where they, you know, some patients got the immunotherapy, some people didn't, and they had this test that they were convinced would predict the benefit of the drug. And that test didn't predict the benefit of the drug at all. 
there's there's a little bit of benefit in both groups, mark, mark a positive, mark a negative. That's where again the diagnosis comes in because you're not measuring enough of the immunological profile of the tumor with that very simple test. You need the sort of techniques that we're talking about. But to actually answer the question, not only is it an immune system, immune immune uh, repertoire of immune cells that are trying to attack the cancer, but why is that cancer immunogenic? Because you answer that question, maybe you can make a tumor that's not immunogenic more mm -hmm. immunogenic, right? And there's all sorts of tricks and ways you can do that. Lots of research needs to be done. I am structurally unable to have a conference at the Baylor College of Medicine without talking about COVID-19 after a year, <laughs> uh, because that's been the subject of everything we've uh, we've done practically. So I, I'm going to ask, indulge me, I'm going to ask one COVID-19 question. And, and people in the audience, I think everybody can appreciate this. There have been really bad things that happened in COVID-19, 600,000 people dead, so a real national tragedy. But there have been some good things that have come out of it too. Families have reconnected. Uh, we, we've, we've changed our lifestyle in some ways in some positive, uh, positive ways. It's been actually good for some businesses. I'm gonna ask you the COVID question from that perspective, the impact on your work, uh, good or bad today or in the future, what impact did this past year of the global pandemic have on the work that you do? Um, I mean, the good I would say is, um, I mean, treating cancer patients and learning from cancer patients. And uh, because of my previous, uh, you know, institutions and my experience and trying to focus on the metastatic breast cancer, I've been kind of fortunate to learn so much from the cancer patients. So it's really such a humbling experience. So even though I myself is still a young youngster, I mean, getting older, but I feel like I've learned so much of the life wisdom from my patients every single day. And then I think COVID-19 emphasize that even triple or quadruple level that it makes you understand how important. So I have, for example, metastatic breast cancer patient who used to come with the two of her best friends who couldn't come during the COVID-19. I assumed that they were not there because of the COVID-19. I found that actually both of them died of the COVID-19. Um, while my metastatic breast cancer patient, they were so worried about is still thriving. So there's a, so much of the um, different perspective that you learn, of course, all the clinical trials were on hold for a while. We couldn't collect any specimen. There has to be only shuttle to have that one tube of blood to be delivered. So it was a lot of challenge. Two of the trials that I was trying to move forward basically got closed because they had to shuffle the budget. Uh, and then many of these uh, postdocs and researchers we were supposed to hire uh, when had to go with the uh, freeze and you know challenges and all of that. So the research is stopped, but I'm hoping that we will learn from this experience and then actually do better <laughs> based on our perspective and the attitudes that we learn. Yeah, we're going to wrap things up here in just a second, but I, I would add to that just, just a, a word of advice to the, our audience. Uh, we have seen at Baylor, we've seen nationally a, a pretty sharp drop off over the past year of people getting the routine screening uh, procedures. I would encourage everyone on this call and talk to all your friends and family um, and get your screening mammogram, get your routine screening health uh, tests, because uh, the best way to not to get breast, to, to have a, a severe breast cancer is not to get breast cancer at all. So uh, pay attention to your screening. Last question, this is an important question because again, there are a lot of people on this call that have been very generous in support of the Breast Center, very generous in support of Daniel Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center. The fact that we were able to generate $2.1 billion in funding for cancer really was dependent almost entirely on philanthropy and letting people and people providing seed money to sort of prime the pump so we can get NIH funding and we can uh, we can explore other sources of revenue. So, so great success. So specifically, when you look at what you're doing today and to the people that might be looking to help to advance this and speed up this process and this complex mechanism you've outlined, what specifically today does philanthropy do to help you accomplish what you need to do? Well, almost everything I was talking about has depended on philanthropy, both the instrumentation that you were looking at, the specimen acquisition approaches, because we're doing things that aren't part of the standard of care. So you need special people to collect specimens and deliver them. Um, and then, of, of course, uh, you know, there's the laboratory experiments that we do to sort of connect the dots and invent new therapies. 
the NIH doesn't fund the pipe dream. It wants to see that you're sort of a good 30% into the experiment uh, to gain the confidence that, the, that they should release precious tax dollars money to us to make things happen. That's true for all the, all the funders, including the foundations. And so that philanthropy is absolutely critical. And I tell you, the leverage on that philanthropy is amazing. I mean, it would make Wall Street swoon. And the average VC company, oh, we want just three, you know, three or four or five-fold return on investment. Philanthropy mm -hmm. return on investment is 20-fold, 30-fold. It's unbelievable. Relatively small amounts of money can have massive impact. And so I just want to take the opportunity to thank anyone on the line who's already contributed. Uh, it's been, um, that's one of the joys at Baylor is the relationship with, my, with donors and, uh, and explaining to them how it all works. And of course, uh, showing them the, uh, how, how we've leveraged their, their money and made progress. Outstanding. I would echo that. Thanks. And I would also say perhaps we could hire somebody else so poor Dr. Lim can sleep, which would be. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to thank everybody for being here uh, today, for your time, your attention, your generosity, your support of this program over the years, which has been a great success for, for Baylor, largely a success because of a lot of people out there. Uh, and hope you join us next time. And I hope it's face to face and we get to shake hands and uh, be together. So we'll, we'll have food, we'll have snacks. It'll be great. So, so sign up next time you see the invitation. Thank you for being here and we'll see you, uh, see you in a few months. Thank you.